This is a devotional book by Ellen G. White. Our High Calling. Part 8. August. Necessity of Self-Cultivation. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. How can I best present before the youth the necessity of self-cultivation, is my constant inquiry. I would urge upon our youth to regard every moment of time as golden. Do not waste it in indolence, do not spend it in folly. But grasp the higher treasures. Cultivate the thoughts and expand the soul by girding about the mind, not allowing it to be filled with unimportant matters. Secure every advantage within your reach for strengthening the intellect. Do not be satisfied with a low standard. Do not rest content until by faithful endeavor, watchfulness, and earnest prayer, you have secured the wisdom that is from above. Thus you may rise in character, and gain an influence over other minds, enabling you to lead them in the path of uprightness and holiness. This is your privilege. Cherish every ray of light that you can obtain by searching the Word of God. Take up your God-given work today, and see how much good you can accomplish in the strength of Christ. Make God your counselor. Discipline and control the mental faculties. Self-control is a power that all may possess. It is gained by placing the will wholly on the side of God, taking the will of God for your will. Christ can and will, if we submit to Him, fill the chambers of the mind and the recesses of the soul with His Spirit. Then our will will be in perfect harmony with the divine will. Our spirit and will, may be so identified with His Spirit and will, that in thought and aim, we shall be one with Him. Then Satan will no longer control us. Christ is our leader, and His followers love to keep step and step with Him. He speaks, and they obey His voice as one mind and one soul. Dear youth, the very best thing you can do is to enlist freely and decidedly in the army of the Lord. Surrender yourself into the hands of God, that your will and ways may be guided by the One who is unerring in wisdom and infinite in goodness. Let your name be enrolled in the heavenly records as one of the chosen and elect of God. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We should carefully weigh the matters relative to the work we take up. Will this work be a blessing to souls? God has not given us work merely to keep us busy, but for His name's glory. Many are busily engaged gathering wood, hay, and stubble. But this will all be consumed. By God's appointment each man has his post of duty. The careful, prayerful inquiry is to be made, what duty is assigned us individually, as men and women under accountability to God? And whether our labor be wholly limited to spiritual things, or whether it is temporal and spiritual combined, we are to faithfully discharge our work. Things secular and things sacred must be combined, but spiritual things are not to be hidden by secular matters. Christ requires the service of the whole being, the physical, mental, and moral powers combined. These are to be enlisted in God's service. Man is to remember that God has the ownership of all, and that his pursuits are invested with a sacredness that they did not possess before he enlisted in the army of the Lord. Every action is to be a consecrated action, for it occupies God's entrusted talent of time. Holiness unto the Lord is inscribed on all the actions of such a one, because his whole being is brought under subjection to God. No business is to be undertaken, even in ordinary life. If it is corrupting in its influence upon the senses. We are in the Lord's training school, and He has His own appointed means whereby we may be brought into His service. Many are troubled because they are not working directly for the advancement of God's kingdom. But the humblest work must not be ignored. If it is honest work, it is a blessing, and may lead to the higher parts of the work. Whether we have one year before us, or five, or ten, we are to be faithful to our trust today. We are to perform each day's duties as faithfully as though that day were to be our last. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There are many who are absorbed in worldly business, 
and they do not give the Lord that devotion which is essential for their spiritual improvement. They tax brain, bone, and muscle to the uttermost, and gather to themselves burdens which lead them to forget God. Their spiritual powers are not exercised as well as their physical powers, and every day they are on the losing side, growing poorer and poorer in heavenly riches. There is another class who meet with loss because they are indolent and spend their powers in pleasing themselves, in using their tongues, and letting their muscles rust with inaction. They waste their opportunities by inaction, and do not glorify God. There is something for everyone to do in this world of ours. The Lord is coming, and our waiting is to be not a time of idle expectation, but of vigilant work. We are not to spend our time wholly in prayerful meditation, neither are we to drive and hurry in work as if this were required in order that we should gain heaven. While neglecting to devote time to the cultivation of personal piety, there must be a combination of meditation and diligent work. As God has expressed it in His Word, we are to be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Worldly activities are not to crowd out the service of the Lord. The soul needs the riches of the grace of God, and the body needs physical exercise, in order to accomplish the work that must be done for the promulgation of the gospel of Christ. Parents should teach their children that the Lord means them to be diligent workers, not idlers in His vineyard. Each one is to act his part in the great work for humanity. Thus the lamp of the soul will not be neglected, if time is taken to pray and to search the scriptures. The allotted task may be done, and the lamp of the soul kept trimmed and burning. The way of the slothful man is an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Industry is a blessing to youth. A life of idleness is to be shunned by a young man as a vice. However humble the occupation may be, if only honorable, if the humble duties are done faithfully, he will not lose his reward. Industry is essential to health. If habits of industry were encouraged, a door would be closed against a thousand temptations. Those who lounge away their days, having no aim or object in life, are troubled with dejection and tempted to seek amusement in forbidden indulgences which enervate the system and tax the physical powers tenfold more than the most taxing labor. Indolence destroys more than hard labor. Many die because they have not the ability or inclination to set themselves to work. Nothing to do has killed its thousands. If youth will preserve habits of virtue and strict purity, and observe the laws God has established in the being, they may preserve their lives although required to perform severe labor during their lifetime. Long life is the heritage of diligence. Some young men think if they could spend a life in doing nothing they would be supremely happy. They cultivate a hatred for useful labor. They envy the sons of pleasure who devote their lives to amusement and gaiety. Unhappiness and heartaches are the result of such thoughts and conduct. Nothing to do has sunk many a young man in perdition. Well-regulated labor is essential for the success of every youth. God could not have inflicted a greater curse upon men and women than to doom them to live a life of inaction. Idleness will destroy soul and body. The heart, the moral character, and physical energies are enfeebled. The intellect suffers, and the heart is open to temptation as an open avenue to sink into every vice. The indolent man tempts the devil to tempt him. Religion will prove to you an anchor. Communion with God will impart to every holy impulse a vigor that will make the duties of life a pleasure. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. God placed our first parents in paradise, surrounding them with all that was useful and lovely. In their Eden home nothing was wanting that could minister to their comfort and happiness. And to Adam was given the work of caring for the garden. The Creator knew that Adam could not be happy without employment. The beauty of the garden delighted him, but this was not enough. He must have labor to call in to exercise the wonderful organs of the body. Had happiness consisted in doing nothing, man, in his state of holy innocence, would have been left unemployed. But he who created man knew what would be for his happiness, and no sooner had he created him, then he gave him his appointed work. The promise of future glory, 
and the decree that man must toil for his daily bread, came from the same throne. When the body is inactive, the blood flows sluggishly, and the muscles decrease in size and strength. Physical exercise, and a free use of air and sunlight blessings which heaven has abundantly bestowed on all would give life and strength to many an emaciated invalid. Work is a blessing, not a curse. Diligent labor keeps many, young and old, from the snares of him who finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Let no one be ashamed of work, for honest toil is ennobling. While the hands are engaged in the most common tasks, the mind may be filled with high and holy thoughts. Drowsiness and indolence destroy godliness, and grieve the Spirit of God. A stagnant pool is offensive, but a pure, flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. No man or woman who is converted can be anything but a worker. There certainly is and ever will be employment in heaven. The redeemed will not live in a state of dreamy idleness. There remains a rest for the people of God, a rest, which they will find in serving Him, to whom they owe all, they have and are. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of every one that is hasty only to want. How many youth who might have become men of usefulness and power have failed because in early life they contracted habits of indecision which followed them through life to cripple all their efforts. Now and then they are filled with sudden zeal to do some great thing, but they leave their work half finished and it comes to nothing. Patient continuance in well-doing is indispensable to success. Temperate, persevering, steady labor will achieve far more than can be accomplished by spasmodic efforts. Labor was appointed to man by his Creator. God provided employment for our first parents in Holy Eden. And since the fall, man has been a twaller, eating his bread by the sweat of his brow. Every bone of his body, every feature of his countenance, every muscle of his limbs, evinces the fact that he was made for activity not for idleness. Habits of industry should be formed in youth. The faithful discharge of life's duties, whatever your position, calls for a wise improvement of all the talents and abilities that God has given you. Guard against being always hurried, yet accomplishing nothing worthy of the effort. These fruitless efforts are often caused by a failure to do the work at the proper time. Whatever is neglected at the time when it should be performed, whether in secular or in religious things, is rarely done well. Many appear to labor diligently every hour in the day. And yet produce no results to correspond with their efforts. Be careful not to fritter away your time upon trifles, and then fail to carry out your undertakings that are of real account. A steadfast adherence to a purpose is necessary in order to secure the end. A distinguished man was once asked how it was possible for him to accomplish such a vast amount of business. His answer was, I do one thing at a time. Jesus was an earnest worker, and those who follow his example will experience self-denial, toil, and sacrifice. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A false balance is a symbol of all unfair dealing, all devices to conceal selfishness and injustice under an appearance of fairness and equity. God will not in the slightest degree favor such practices. He hates every false way. He abhors all selfishness and covetousness. Unmerciful dealing he will not tolerate, but will repay in kind. God can give prosperity to the working men whose means are acquired honestly. But his curse rests upon all that is gained by selfish practices. When one indulges in selfishness or sharp dealing, he shows that he does not fear the Lord or reverence his name. Those who are connected with God will not only shun all injustice, but will manifest his mercy and goodness toward all with whom they have to do. The Lord will sanction no respect of person, but he will not approve the course of those who make no difference in favor of the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Your religious faith must elevate you above every low trick. Industry, faithfulness, a firm adherence to right, and trust in God will ensure success. Move slowly, honestly, upon strictly Bible principles, or stop business. No bargain is ever made, no debt is ever paid, in which God is not concerned. He is the all-wise, eternal guardian of justice.
you can never exclude God from any matter in which the rights of His people are involved. The hand of God is spread as a shield over all His creatures. No man can wound your rights without smiting that hand. You can wound no man's rights without smiting it. That hand holds the sword of justice. Beware how you deal with men. Your light shining in your business life, exhibiting the power of practical godliness, is worth vastly more to all with whom you come in contact than sermons or creeds. The world will watch and criticize and take knowledge of you in the midst of your temporal affairs, with keenness and severity. What you say in the church is not of half as much consequence as what you do in your daily business. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. The religion of Christ enjoins upon men to carry the pure principles of truth into their daily life, in buying and selling, in the transaction of all business, with as true a sense of religious obligation as that with which they offer to God their supplications. Business must not divert the soul from God. You should by your example demonstrate to the world that the truth of God sanctifies the receiver and produces industry. Frugality and perseverance, while it extirpates avarice, overreaching, and every species of dishonesty. Nothing is worth so much to a young man just starting out in life as a reputation for unbending integrity. Every business transaction is to be such as can be endorsed by heaven, else it will bear the unsavory odor of Satan's influence. Every action is to represent the science of heaven's principles. Truthfulness and frankness should be ever cherished by all who claim to be followers of Christ. God and the right should be the motto. Deal honestly and righteously in this present evil world. Some will be honest when they see that honesty will not endanger their worldly interests, but all who act from this principle will have their names blotted out of the book of life. Strict honesty must be cultivated. We can go through the world but once, we cannot come back to rectify any mistakes, therefore every move made should be with godly fear and careful consideration. Honesty and policy will not harmonize. Either policy will be subdued, and truth and honesty hold the lines of control, or policy will take the lines, and honesty cease to direct. Both cannot act together, they can never be in agreement. When God makes up His jewels, the true, the frank, the honest, will be His chosen ones, His treasures. Angels are preparing crowns for such, and light from the throne of God will be reflected in its splendor from these star-gemmed diadems. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Life is not made up of great things alone, it is the little things that make the sum of life's happiness or miseries. It is the little things in life that reveal a person's real character. Oh, if all youth and those of mature age could see as I have seen the mirror of persons' lives presented before them, they would look more gravely upon even the little duties of life. Every mistake, every error, unimportant though it may be regarded, leaves a scar in this life and a blot on the heavenly records. Life is full of duties that are not agreeable, but all these unpleasant duties will be made agreeable by a cheerful performance of them because it is right. Taking an interest in the duties which someone must do, and striving to do them with the heart, will make the most disagreeable duties pleasant. There are many who undervalue the small events of life, the little deeds that are to be performed day by day. But these are not to be estimated as small, as every action tells either for the blessing or the injuring of someone. Every action tells its own story, it bears its own history to the throne of God. It is known whether it is on the side of right or on the side of wrong. It is only by acting in accordance with the principles of God's word in the small transactions of life, that we place ourselves on the right side. We are tried and tested by these small occurrences, and our character will be estimated according as our work shall be. It is the conscientious attention to what the world calls little things that makes the great beauty and success of life. Little deeds of charity, little words of kindness, little acts of self-denial, a wise improvement of opportunities, a diligent cultivation of little talents, make great men in God's sight. I thank my God always on your behalf, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him, in all utterance, and in all knowledge. 
There is need to cultivate every grace that Jesus has brought within our reach, for that grace alone can remedy our defects, Christ alone can transform the character. And God would have us manifest this grace, so richly provided, in the little as well as the large things of life. Our God is a God of order and He desires that His children shall will to bring themselves into order. And under His discipline. If the youth would form habits of regularity and order, they would improve in health, in spirits, in memory, and in disposition. It is the duty of all to observe strict rules in their habits of life. This is for your own good, dear youth, both physically and morally. When you rise in the morning, take into consideration, as far as possible, the work you must accomplish during the day. If necessary, have a small book in which to jot down the things that need to be done. And set yourself a time in which to do your work. Slow, dilatory habits make much work out of very little. But if you will, you may overcome these fussy, lingering habits. The exercise of the willpower will make the hands move deftly. These matters have been looked upon as little things, and almost unworthy of notice. But many are deceived as to the importance of these little things. They bear strongly upon the great whole. God does not regard anything as unimportant that pertains to the well-being of the human family. He gave His only begotten Son for the body as well as for the soul, and all is to be consecrated to Him. Great truth can be brought into little things, practical religion must be carried into the lowly duties of daily life. And in the performance of these duties, you are forming characters that will stand the test of the judgment. Then, in whatever position you may be placed, whatever your duties may be, do them nobly and faithfully, realizing that all heaven is beholding your work. Catch the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. God requires us to be right in important matters, while He tells us that faithfulness in little things will fit us for higher positions of trust. The good qualities which many possess are hidden, and instead of attracting souls to Christ they repulse them. If these persons could see the influence of their uncourteous ways and unkind expressions upon unbelievers, and how offensive is such conduct in the sight of God. They would reform their habits, for a lack of courtesy is one of the greatest stumbling blocks to sinners. Selfish, complaining, sour Christians bar the way, so that sinners do not care to approach Christ. Could we look beneath the surface of things, we should see that half-life's misery is created by frowns and unkind speeches, which might be prevented as well as not. Many make a hell upon earth for themselves and for those whom they might comfort and bless. These are not worthy of the Christian name. Some persons speak in a harsh, uncourteous manner, that wounds the feeling of others, and then they justify themselves by saying, It is my way, I always tell just what I think, and they exalt this wicked trait of character as a virtue. Their uncourteous deportment should be firmly rebuked. That unkind word should be left unspoken, that selfish disregard for the happiness of others should give place to sympathy and thoughtfulness. True courtesy, blended with truth and justice, will make the life not only useful, but fragrant. Integrity, justice, and Christian kindness, blended, make a beautiful combination. Courtesy is one of the graces of the Spirit. It is an attribute of heaven. The angels never fly into a passion, never are envious, selfish, and jealous. No harsh or unkind words escape their lips. And if we are to be the companions of angels, we too must be refined and courteous. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all failures of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It is of the highest importance that Sabbath keepers live out their faith in every particular. They should be prompt and neat, and keep their business matters all straight. None should be so fearful of being like the world that it will lead them to be careless in their houses, leaving things in disorder and uncleanness. It is not pride to be neat in dress. Cleanly in person, orderly and tasteful in their household arrangements. These outside appearances tell the business character of those living in the house, and not only this but the religious character of its inmates. It is impossible for a slack, disorderly person to make a good Christian. 
Their lives, in temporal and religious things, are just as disorderly as their dress, houses, persons, and premises. There is order in heaven. There are rules and regulations which govern the whole heavenly host. All move in order. All there is cleanly, all in perfect harmony. And everyone who will be counted worthy to enter heaven will be thoroughly disciplined and will be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The uncultivated have spots and wrinkles upon them now. They had better lose no time in commencing the work of cleansing themselves from all failures of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. God loves purity, cleanliness, order, and holiness. God requires all His people who lack these qualifications to seek them and never rest until they obtain them. They must commence the work of reform and elevate their lives, so that in conversation and deportment their acts, their lives, will be a continual recommendation of their faith and will have such a winning, compelling power upon unbelievers that they will be compelled to acknowledge that they are the children of God. The truth as it is in Jesus will not degrade but elevate the receiver, purify his life, refine his taste, sanctify his judgment. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. God would have His children realize that in order to glorify Him, their affection must be given to those who most need it. No selfishness, in look, word, or deed, is to be manifested when dealing with those of like precious faith, whether they be high or low, rich or poor. The love that gives kind words to only a few, while others are treated with coldness and indifference, is not love, but selfishness. It will not in any way work for the good of souls or the glory of God. Our love is not to be sealed up for special ones, to the neglect of others. Break the bottle, and the fragrance will fill the house. Those who gather the sunshine of Christ's righteousness, and do not let it shine forth into the lives of others, will soon lose the sweet, bright rays of heavenly grace, selfishly reserved to be lavished only upon a few. Those who possess much affection are responsible to God to bestow this affection on all who need help. To love as Christ loved means to manifest unselfishness at all times and in all places, by kind words and pleasant looks. These cost those who give them, nothing, but they leave behind a fragrance that surrounds the soul. Their effect can never be estimated. Not only are they a blessing to the receiver, but to the giver, for they react upon him. Genuine love is a precious attribute of heavenly origin, which increases in fragrance in proportion as it is dispensed to others. The souls of those who love Jesus will be surrounded with a pure fragrant atmosphere. There are those who hide their soul hunger. These will be greatly helped by a tender word or a kind remembrance. The heavenly gifts, freely and richly bestowed by God, are in turn to be freely bestowed by us upon all who come within the sphere of our influence. Thus we reveal a love that is heaven-born, and which will increase as it is freely used in blessing others. Thus we glorify God. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Oh, how hard many make the Christian life! They climb the steep, briery path, staggering under imposed burdens, as though they must tinker up the characters of others. They do not experience the sweet peace of Christ. They do not grasp the help Jesus gives them, but they are continually grieving over supposed wrongs of others, and overlook the cheering, blessed tokens for good all along their pathway. Just as soon as one has a vivid and all-absorbing consciousness of his own personal accountability to God and of his duty to his fellow men, and senses that his influence is far-reaching, stretching into eternity, he will not be satisfied with a low standard, he will not be fault-finding and critical of others. He will make his own life what he would wish the lives of others to be. He will live only in Christ, utterly and wholly dependent on him for every beauty and loveliness of character. We should be weeding out of our thoughts all complaining and fault-finding. Let us not continue to look upon any defects that we may see. If we would get the right hold on God, we must keep beholding the great precious things the purity, the glory, the power, the kindness, the affection, the love, that God bestows upon us. And thus beholding, 
our minds will become so fixed upon these things of eternal interest that we shall have no desire to find the flaws in others. Think of the Lord Jesus and His merits and His love, but do not seek to find the defects and dwell upon the mistakes that others have made. Call to your mind the things worthy of your recognition and your praise, and if you are sharp to discern errors in others, be more sharp to recognize the good and praise the good. You may, if you criticize yourselves, find things just as objectionable as that which you see in others. Then let us work constantly to strengthen one another in the most holy faith. Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Our bodies are built up from what we eat and drink, and the character of our spiritual experience depends on what our minds feed upon and assimilate. By continually dwelling upon the mistakes and defects of others, many become religious dyspeptics. Those who are so busy in dissecting the words and acts of others, to discover all that is objectionable, fail to discern the good and pleasant things. They do not eat of the proper food to promote spiritual vitality and healthy growth. The Lord is not pleased with His people when they neglect to criticize their own soul, criticizing others instead. This is Satan's work. When you do this work, remember that the enemy is using you as a means of tempting others, in order that those who should be united in harmony and joy, building up one another in the most holy faith, shall be warring and complaining because someone else is sinning. Christ has not made you a sin-bearer. You cannot even bear your own sin. Therefore be very careful not to take up any reproach against your neighbor. God wants His people to be free. Shall we not remember that by the words we speak we may either wound or heal? Shall we not remember that as we judge, so we shall be judged, we who perhaps have had many more opportunities than those whom we judge? Our hearts must be melted into tenderness and love for one another. We may criticize ourselves just as severely as we please. The one who criticizes another gives evidence that he is the very one who needs to criticize himself. Pray God to show you what you must remove from yourselves in order that you may see the kingdom of God. There is a crown for the overcomer. Do you want it? Do you want to run the race with patience? Then do not seek to find something to condemn in your neighbor, but look right to Jesus Christ. Behold His purity, and you will be charmed and will reflect His likeness. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Envy and jealousy are diseases which disorder all the faculties of the being. They originated with Satan in paradise. Those who listen to Satan's voice will demerit others, and will misrepresent and falsify in order to build up themselves. But nothing that defile can enter heaven, and unless those who cherish this spirit are changed, they can never enter there, for they would criticize the angels. They would envy another's crown. They would not know what to talk of unless they could bring up the imperfections and errors of others. Oh, that such would become changed by beholding Christ. Oh, that they would become meek and lowly by learning of Him. Then they would go forth, not as missionaries for Satan, to cause disunion and alienation, to bruise and mangle character, but as missionaries for Christ, to be peacemakers and to restore. Let the Holy Spirit come in and expel this unholy passion, which cannot survive in heaven. Let it die, let it be crucified. Open the heart to the attributes of Christ, who was holy, harmless, undefiled. The Word of God exhorts, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. True moral worth does not seek to make a place for itself by thinking and speaking evil, by depreciating others. All envy, all jealousy, all evil speaking, with all unbelief, must be put away from God's children. The Bible is full of instruction in joining us to show love, patience, and respect in our speech and in our treatment of one another. The love of Jesus in the soul never leads to malice and envy. The tender plant of Christ-like love must be carefully cherished. It will not grow unless it is cultivated. Heaven takes notice of the one who carries about with him an atmosphere of peace and love. Such a one will receive his reward. He will stand in the great day of the Lord. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. 
how Satan exults when he is enabled to set the soul into a white heat of anger. A glance, a gesture, an intonation, may be seized upon and used, as the arrow of Satan, to wound and poison the heart that is open to receive it. When one once gives place to an angry spirit he is just as much intoxicated as the man who has put the glass to his lips. Christ treats anger as murder. Passionate words are a savor of death unto death. He who utters them is not cooperating with God to save his fellow man. In heaven this wicked railing is placed in the same list as common swearing. While hatred is cherished in the soul there is not one iota of the love of God there. When you feel an angry spirit arising, take firm hold of Jesus Christ by faith. Utter no word. Danger lies in the utterance of a single word when you are angry, for a volley of passionate utterances will follow. The man who gives way to folly in speaking passionate words bears false witness, for he is never just. He exaggerates every defect he thinks he sees, he is too blind and unreasonable to be convinced of his madness. He transgresses the commandments of God, and his imagination is perverted by the inspiration of Satan. He knows not what he is doing. Blind and deaf, he permits Satan to take the helm and guide him wherever he pleases. The door is then thrown open to malice, to envy, and to evil surmisings, and the poor victim is borne helplessly on. But there is hope while the hours of probation linger, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. This is the standard for which every Christian must strive, not in his own natural ability, but through the grace given him of Jesus Christ. Let us wrestle for the mastery over every sin, and be able to check every impatient, fretful expression. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. In dealing with our fellow men we all are to consider that they are of like passions with ourselves, feeling the same weaknesses and suffering the same temptations. They, with us, have a struggle with life if they maintain their integrity. True Christian courtesy unites and perfects both justice and politeness, and mercy and love make up the filling, giving the finest touches and most graceful charms to the character. Abraham was a true gentleman. In his life we have the finest example of the power of true courtesy. Look at his course with Lot. How courteously he welcomes the travelers, the messengers of God, to his tent, and entertains them. He bowed before the sons of hate when he purchased of them a cave in which to bury his beloved Sarah. Well did Abraham know what was due from man to his fellow man. Paul, though firm as a rock to principle, yet ever preserved his courtesy. He was zealous for the vital points and was not regardless of the grace and politeness due to social life. The man of God did not absorb the man of humanity. But we present a greater than Abraham and Paul the Savior of the world. His life was a striking illustration of genuine courtesy. It is impossible to enumerate the instances of his kindness, courtesy, and tender sympathy and love. What rays of softness and beauty did his marvelous condescension shed over his entire life? He had a kind look and an encouraging word for all who were wearied and worn with labor. He was ready to help the most helpless. Love, courtesy, amiability these are never lost. When men shall be changed from mortal to immortal, all the deeds of sanctified goodness done by them will be made manifest. These deeds will be preserved through the eternal ages. Not one, however small or simple, is ever lost. Through the merits of Christ's imputed righteousness they preserve their fragrance. And be you kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. We must learn to place the best possible construction upon doubtful conduct of others. If we are ever suspecting evil we are in danger of creating what we allow ourselves to suspect. We cannot pass along without sometimes having our feelings hurt and our temper tried, but as Christians we must be just as patient, forbearing, humble, and meek as we desire others to be. Oh! How many thousand good acts and deeds of kindness that we receive pass from the mind like dew before the sun, while imaginary or real injury leaves an impression which it is next to impossible to efface. 
The very best example to give to others is to be right ourselves, and then leave ourselves, our reputation, with God and not show too great anxiety to right every wrong impression and present our case in a favorable light. The neglect to cultivate tender consideration and forbearance for one another has caused dissension, distrust, fault-finding, and general disunion. God calls upon us to put away this great sin and to strive to answer the prayer of Christ that His disciples may be one as He is one with the Father. It is the special work of Satan to cause dissension, that the world should be deprived of the most powerful testimony Christians can give it that God has sent His Son to bring into harmony turbulent, proud, envious, jealous, bigoted minds. The truth of God is not designed merely to deal with errors and vices. The truth is designed to sanctify the receiver, to fashion and mold the entire man, externally as well as internally, by abasing pride and disposing his heart to be kind and amiable and condescending. Yes, the religion of Christ is a system of the truest politeness, and its triumphs are complete when a world may look on a people professing godliness with a united front, believers showing habitual tenderness of feeling and kindness of deportment and sincere regard for the reputation of each other. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience. Kind words, pleasant looks, a cheerful countenance, throw a charm around the Christian that makes his influence almost irresistible. This is a way to gain respect, and extend the sphere of usefulness, which costs but little. It is the religion of Christ in the heart that causes the words issuing therefrom to be gentle and the demeanor condescending, even to those in the humblest walks of life. A blustering, fault-finding, overbearing man is not a Christian, for to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. He who drinks in the Spirit of Christ will let it flow forth in kind words, and be expressed in courteous deportment. The plan of salvation is to soften whatever is harsh and rough in the temper, and to smooth off whatever is rugged or sharp in the manners. External change will testify of an internal change. The truth is the sanctifier, the refiner. Received into the heart, it works with hidden power. Transforming the receiver. But those who profess the truth and at the same time are rough, and sour, and unkind in words and deportment, have not learned of Jesus. All these manifestations show that they are yet servants of the wicked one. No man can be a Christian without having the Spirit of Christ, manifesting meekness, gentleness, and refinement of manners. Pleasant, kind, and well-bred Christians will have an influence for God and His truth, it cannot be otherwise. The light borrowed from heaven will shed its brightening rays through them to the pathway of others. The words we speak, our daily deportment, are the fruit growing upon the tree. If the fruit is sour and unpalatable, the rootlets of that tree are not drawing nourishment from a pure source. If our affections are brought into harmony with our Savior, if our characters are meek and lowly, we evidence that our life is hid with Christ in God, and we shall leave behind us a bright track. Beholders will discern that we have been with Jesus and learned of Him. Forbearing one another, and, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We are in this world to meet with persons of varied minds and different temperaments, and you must consider that they do not differ with you any more than you differ with them. We are to cultivate forbearance, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and love and be bound together by the ties of human brotherhood. May the dear Saviour be a welcome guest in your heart. If Christ is abiding in your heart, you will manifest Christ in your words, the law of kindness will be upon your tongues, and you will have peace within. Then all will be peace without, and you will make melody to God in your hearts. A blessing rests upon the peacemakers. Oh, that the Lord would imbue me with His Holy Spirit, that I shall ever be what Christ calls a peacemaker. I do not love the atmosphere of strife and contention. I want to be able to say the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, how can we utter this prayer and be unforgiving? To judge our brethren, to allow feelings to be cherished against them, even if we feel they have not done exactly right toward us, will bring no blessing to our hearts and will not help the case at all. I dare not allow my feelings to run in the channel of hunting up all my grievances and telling them over and over, 
and dwelling in the atmosphere of distrust, enmity, and dissension. There is light in following Jesus. Talking of Jesus, loving Jesus, and I will not allow my mind to think or speak ill of my brethren. Inasmuch, said Christ, as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. I would not feel unkindness or hatred to anyone. I would not be an accuser of my brethren. Satan will try to stir up my mind to do this, but I cannot do it. I will cherish the forgiving spirit of Jesus. Charity suffers long, and is kind, charity envies not, charity vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Many have a vivid, unsanctified sensitiveness which keeps them constantly on the alert for some word, some look, or some action which they can construe as a lack of respect and appreciation. All this must be overcome. Everyone should go forward in the fear of God, doing his best without being troubled by praise or offended by censure. Serving God fervently, and learning to place the most favorable interpretation upon whatever in others may seem offensive. We may expect that false reports will circulate about us, but if we follow a straight course, if we remain indifferent to these things, others will also be indifferent. Let us leave to God the care of our reputation. Slander can be lived down by our manner of living, it is not lived down by words of indignation. Let our great anxiety be to act in the fear of God. And show by our conduct that these reports are false. No one can injure our character as much as ourselves. It is the weak trees and the tottering houses that need to be constantly propped. When we show ourselves so anxious to protect our reputation against attacks from the outside, we give the impression that it is not blameless before God, and that it needs therefore to be continually bolstered up. It does not behoove those from whom Jesus has so much to bear, in their failings and perversity. To be ever mindful of slights and real or imaginary offense. The heart filled with that love which thinks no evil will not be on the watch to notice discourtesies and grievances of which he may be the object. The will of God is that his love shall close the eyes, the ears, and the heart to all such provocations and to all the suggestions with which Satan would fill them. There is a noble majesty in the silence of the one exposed to evil surmising or outrage. To be master of one's spirit is to be stronger than kings or conquerors. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Whatever we are at heart will be revealed in character, and will have an influence on all those with whom we associate. Our words, our actions, are a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. And in the judgment we shall be brought face to face with those whom we might have helped in right, safe paths by choice words. By counsel, if we had daily connection with God and a living, abiding interest in the saving of their souls. The Christian should not be content to be merely an active man of business. He should not be so absorbed in worldly affairs as to have scarcely a spare moment or a thought for recreation or friendship, for the good of others, for the culture of the mind, or the welfare of the soul. Energy and diligence in business are commendable, but these should not lead us to neglect that love for God and man which the Bible enjoins. Our course in temporal matters, our conduct toward one another, is commented upon with keenness and severity. What we say in the church is not of so great consequence as our deportment in the home circle and among our neighbors. The kindly word, the thoughtful act, true politeness and hospitality, will constantly exert an influence in favor of the Christian religion. Let not the testimony be borne concerning any of us, religion has made them no better. They are as self-indulgent, as worldly, as sharp in trade, as ever. All who bear such fruit scatter from Christ, instead of gathering with Him. They place obstacles in the way of those whom they might by a consistent course have won to Jesus. It is our duty as Christians to give the world unmistakable evidence that we are obeying the great commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is the same as our Savior's golden rule. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Pure religion brings peace, happiness, contentment, 
godliness is profitable to this life and the life to come. That unrest and discontent which ends in fretting and complaining is sinful, but the discontent with oneself which urges on to more earnest effort for greater improvement of the mind for a broader field of usefulness is praiseworthy. This discontent does not end in disappointment but in gathering force for a higher and more extended field of usefulness. Only be ever balanced by firm religious principle and a sensitive conscience, having ever the fear of God before you, and you will certainly prosper in becoming fitted for a life of usefulness. We should live for the next world. It is so wretched to live a haphazard, aimless life. We want an object in life to live for a purpose. God help us all to be self-sacrificing, less self-caring, more forgetful of self and selfish interest, and to do good, not for the honor we expect to receive here. But because this is the object of our life and will answer the end of our existence. Let our daily prayer go up to God that He will divest us of selfishness. I have seen that those who live for a purpose, seeking to benefit and bless their fellow men and to honor and glorify their Redeemer, are the truly happy ones on the earth, while the man who is restless, discontented, and seeking this and testing that, hoping to find happiness, is always complaining of disappointment. He is always in want. Never satisfied, because he lives for himself alone. Let it be your aim to do good, to act your part in life faithfully. Be anxious and earnest to grow in grace, seeking for a more distinct and intelligent understanding of the will of God concerning you, striving earnestly for the mark of the prize before you. Christian perfection alone will win the spotless robes of character which will entitle you to stand before the throne of God among the blood-washed throng, bearing the palm branch of everlasting victory and eternal triumph. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Make straight paths for your feet, says the Apostle, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. The path that leads away from God, away from His holy, perfect standard of right, is always crooked and dangerous. Yet many have been walking in this path of transgression. In many cases they did not start right in childhood and youth, and they have pursued crooked paths all the way along. Not only have they erred from the right way themselves but through the influence of their example others have been turned aside from the straight, plain path, and have made fatal mistakes. We do not always realize the power of example. We are brought in contact with others. We meet persons who are erring, who do wrong in various ways, they may be disagreeable, quick, passionate, dictatorial. While dealing with these we must be patient, forbearing, kind, and gentle. Satan works through them to provoke and harass, so that we shall not exhibit a pleasant and lovable disposition. There are trials and perplexities for us all to encounter. For we are in a world of cares, anxieties, and disappointments. But these continual annoyances must be met in the Spirit of Christ. Through grace we may rise superior to our surroundings, and keep our spirits calm and unruffled amid the frets and worries of everyday life. We shall thus represent Christ to the world. Consecration to God must be a living, practical matter, not a theory to be talked about, but a principle interwoven with all our experience. We should let our light so shine before others that they, seeing our good works, shall glorify our Father who is in heaven. We should show forth the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. If the light of heaven is in the soul, it will be reflected to all around us. I wish all could see this important subject in its true light. There would not then be such thoughtlessness of words and acts, such careless, indolent, irreligious living. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Few realize the power of habit. Inspiration asks, can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? And adds, then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. This is a solemn assertion. But there is comfort and courage in the reflection that if evil habits acquire such force that it seems almost impossible to turn in the right direction, the power of good habits is equally strong. The results of each day's work. Whether the tendency be to elevate us in the scale of moral worth or to push us downward toward perdition, are influenced by the days that have preceded it. Defeat today prepares the way for still greater defeat tomorrow, 
victory today ensures an easier victory tomorrow. Then how careful we should be to see that the habits and characters we are forming are correct and virtuous. Young friends, restrain your feet from all evil ways. Men may discipline themselves to do right. Like Daniel they may have a heaven-born purpose in their hearts that they will not defile soul or body. Notwithstanding the degeneracy and corruption of the age. God gave Daniel knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. His blessing attended the man who put forth human effort in accordance with the divine will. The same help will still be given to all who pursue a similar course, and with the glory of God in view practice abstinence and self-restraint. The same difference will be seen between them and the self-indulgent that there was between Daniel and his fellows and the other youth in the king's court. There will be the clear eye and complexion, the firm tread, the strength and vigor of intellect, the keen perception of spiritual truth. Let us remember that character is not the result of accident, but day by day it is forming for good or for evil. Great importance attaches to this work of character building, for it is far-reaching in its results. We are builders for time and for eternity. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. I see a providence in all of God's works. The clouds and rain, as well as the bright sunshine, have their mission in blessings to man. The God of nature knows just what we need and He moves forward in a straight line, sending blessings upon the just and upon the unjust. I am so grateful that finite minds cannot have the ordering of things. What cross-purposes would be revealed? There is a narrowness in human comprehension that is dishonoring to God. Let not him who claims Christ as his Savior entertain the thought that God's mercies are confined to him and to the few in whom he is interested. The love and mercy of God are for everyone. Let us gather up the divine tokens of his favor, and return praise and thanksgiving to him for his goodness, which is bestowed upon us, not to be hoarded, but to be passed along to others. God expects everyone who enjoys His grace to diffuse this grace as freely as Christ bestows His mercies. As the sun shines upon the just and the unjust, so the sun of righteousness reflects light to the whole world. God's blessings, sunshine and showers, heat and cold, and every natural blessing, are given to the world. Exclusiveness is not to be maintained by any people. I am the light of the world. Christ said. Light is a blessing, a universal blessing, which pours forth its treasures on a world unthankful. Unholy, demoralized. The Lord Jesus came to demolish every wall of exclusion, to throw open every wall in the temple where God presides, that every ear may hear, that every eye may see, that every thirsty soul may drink of the water of life freely. God scatters blessings all along our path. We may weep and groan and mourn and stumble at every step if we choose, or we may gather up the precious, fragrant flowers and rejoice in the Lord for His goodness in making our path to heaven so pleasant. Then shall I not be ashamed, when I have respect unto your commandments. In this world we might become hopelessly perplexed, as the devil wants us to be, if we keep looking upon those things that are perplexing, for by dwelling upon them, and talking of them, we become discouraged. In criticizing others because they fail to manifest love, we shall kill the precious plant of love in our own hearts. Have we individually appreciated and felt the warmth of love which Christ represented in His life? Then it is our duty to manifest this love to the world. Let us fear to dwell upon, to behold and talk of the great mistakes that others are making. You may create an unreal world in your own mind and picture an ideal church, where the temptations of Satan no longer prompt to evil, but perfection exists only in your imagination. The world is a fallen world, and the church is a place represented by a field in which grow tares and wheat. They are to grow together until the harvest. It is not our place to uproot the tares, according to human wisdom. Lest under the suggestions of Satan, the wheat may be rooted up. None need to lose the golden moments of time in their short life history through seeking to weigh the imperfections of professed Christians. Not one of us has time to do this. If we see clearly what is the manner of character Christians should develop, and yet see in others that which is inconsistent with this character, 
let us determine that we will firmly resist the enemy in his temptations to make us act in an inconsistent way. And say, I will not make Christ ashamed of me. I will more earnestly study the character of Christ in whom there was no imperfection, no selfishness, no spot, no stain of evil, who lived not to please and glorify himself, but to glorify God and save fallen humanity. I will not copy the defective characters of these inconsistent Christians, and the mistakes that they have made shall not lead me to be like them. I will turn to the precious Saviour, that I may be like Him. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I have a continual longing for Christ to be formed within, the hope of glory. I long to be beautified every day with the meekness and gentleness of Christ, growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ up to the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. I must as an individual, through the grace given me of Jesus Christ, keep my own soul in health by keeping it as a divine channel through which His grace, His love, His patience, His meekness, shall flow to the world. This is my duty and no less the duty of every church member who claims to be a son or a daughter of God. The Lord Jesus has made His church the depository of sacred truth. He has left with her the work of carrying out His purposes and His plans to save the souls for whom He has manifested such interest, such unmeasured love. Like the sun in relation to our world, He rises amid the moral darkness the sun of righteousness. He said of Himself, I am the light of the world. He said to His followers, You are the light of the world. By reflecting the image of Jesus Christ, by the beauty and holiness of their characters, by their continual self-denial and their separation from all idols, large or small, they reveal that they have learned in the school of Christ. They are continually catching the spirit of love and forbearance, meekness, and gentleness, and they stand as representatives of Christ, a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. Walking and working in the world, but not of the world, they are answering in their characters the prayer of Christ, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are to stand as the strong fortress of truth, their light shining far in the moral darkness of the world. The Lord has a message for the watchmen on the walls of Zion to bear. The trumpet is to give no uncertain sound. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. As long as Satan has power to work upon human minds that are not barricaded with the Holy Spirit, there will be stern and earnest conflict between good and evil, and evil will be manifested, even among those who claim to be the children of God. There is no reason for us to fix our eyes upon error, to grieve and complain, and lose precious time and opportunities in lamenting the faults of others. Would it not be more pleasing to God to take an impartial outlook, and see how many souls are serving God, and resisting temptation, and glorifying and honoring Him with their talents of means and intellect? Would it not be better to consider the wonderful, miracle-working power of God in the transformation of poor, degraded sinners? Who have been full of moral pollution, who become so transformed that they are Christ-like in character? Let us turn away our eyes from beholding the imperfections of those who are in the church, but who have not the likeness of Christ. We shall not be held responsible because those who make a high profession do not possess corresponding virtues. Let us thank God that it is our privilege to turn away our eyes from these defective Christians, and look upon those who are truly devoted, who are doers of the Word, and who in life and character bear the image of the Divine. And above all things, thank God that it is your privilege to look upon Christ, the perfect pattern. Everything that causes us to see the weakness of humanity is in the Lord's purpose to help us to look to Him, and in no case put trust in man, or make flesh our arm. We become changed into the image of that upon which we dwell. Then how important to open our hearts to the things that are true and lovely and of good report. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. The Word of God not only sets forth the great principles of truth and duty which should govern our lives, 
but it presents also, for our encouragement, the history of many who have exemplified these principles. Except the one perfect pattern, there is not described in the sacred pages a single character more worthy of emulation than that of the prophet Daniel. Exposed in youth to all the allurements of a royal court, he became a man of unbending integrity and fervent devotion to God. He was subjected to the fierce temptations of Satan, yet his character was not vacillating, nor his course changeable. He was firm where many would be yielding, he was true where they would be false, he was strong where they would be weak. Daniel was a lofty cedar of Lebanon. Would that the faith, integrity, and devotion of the prophet Daniel might live in the hearts of God's people of today. Never were these noble qualities more needed in the world than now. In the records of those who have done and suffered for the name of Jesus, there is no name that shines with a brighter or purer luster than the name of Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. The love of Jesus, glowing in his heart, made him self-forgetful, self-denying. He had seen the risen Christ, and the Saviour's image was impressed upon his soul, and shone forth in his life. With faith, courage, and fortitude, that would not be daunted by danger or stayed by obstacles. He pressed his way from land to land to spread the knowledge of the cross. Are the professed followers of Christ thus exemplifying the principles of their faith? Where are the deep, living, holy experiences which men of God were wont to recount? Has the standard of Christianity been lowered? No, that standard remains just where God placed it. Holy men of ages past were required to give up all for Christ, to cherish His Spirit, and to imitate His example. Nothing less than this will He accept now. When called to give up all for Christ, who will stand the test?